Hey folks, I'm back from a little holiday. I joined up to Kanazawa with the McClymonts, David and Janet McClymont, who live in Melbourne. And with David, I've made some records, as you probably know, two collaborative albums. And uh, it's always nice to see them. They come to Japan quite a lot. And uh, we didn't have perfect weather. It was uh, hailing yesterday in Kanazawa, briefly. Um, but there was a beautiful ambience in the town. The uh, girls were all, all out in their kimonos because of the graduation. It's the end in March, the end of the academic year for students and for schools. So uh, they have various graduation ceremonies and they get dressed up. And so we went to the park, uh, Kenroku Gardens near the castle and looked at the blossom. There's plum blossom, but not yet uh, cherry blossom. So, uh, and there were sunny intervals occasionally. Um, and we saw the fantastic 21st Century Museum in Kanazawa, uh, which is a circular building. And uh, I was just reading Owen Hafferley in Prospect magazine talking about the new circular building which is uh, springing up in Edinburgh in place of the old St. James Centre. It's funny when you walk around with this kind of Japanese stroke Scottish uh, mentality but um, it's been described as the golden turd because it's sort of gold-shaped and uh, has a little flourish on the top, a uh, sort of metal sheeting ribbon, um, which looks a little bit like a sort of turd shape. And I was thinking about Philippe Stark's um, Asahi Beer Hall in Tokyo, which also has a turd flourish, a golden turd sitting on top of it, and which was a very exciting place to go to when I first came to Japan in the early 90s, me and my band we were touring the country, went to the uh, Philippe Stark Beer Hall. And it seemed like um, an example of what you, of the crazy stuff you could do in Japan, even as a Western designer or architect, which you couldn't do in the West. Because Philippe Stark has deliberately made the, uh, the enormous sculpture on the roof of this beer hall look like a turd, as a reference to the endomorphic pleasure of gorging yourself, stuffing yourself in a beer hall, drinking lots of beer, eating lots of food, and then laying a great golden egg <laughs> with the pure pleasure of your guts. Um, I think architecture should be able to make such eccentric gestures, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. What I'm talking about today is politics. I mean, it is, that is all part of it, because Hathaly was describing um, Edinburgh as an inherently conservative city. That is true. Um, I've always felt that. That's one reason I don't live there. Um, I think architecturally, he was uh, saying in this article that architecturally it's very poor and makes a lot of botched decisions um, based on the tendering procuring system that's uh, in place, which I don't really understand. But um, it's a funny old city, even the protected the UNESCO heritage site status which Edinburgh has. And by the way, we were thinking if the weather had been nicer yesterday of going to see the, um, uh, sorry, Wednesday, of going to see um, Shirakawa Go, which Bruno Taut came from Germany and really was impressed by it and managed to get Japan's first UNESCO World Heritage Site status for. And it's an alpine village, about an hour on the bus to, uh, from, from Kanazawa. And um, the Japanese don't really have this UNESCO mentality of protecting whole towns or areas of towns. They really... Um, have a Buddhist um, uh, sense of continuous change. Another thing we saw in Kanazawa was the D.T. Suzuki Museum. D.T. Suzuki uh, was the teacher at Columbia who influenced a whole generation of artists, including John Cage, to become Buddhists. Um, I was a little critical, uh, as uh, when David was particularly keen to see the museum, and I was saying, well, you know, this guy supported Hitler. There are letters of D.T. Suzuki where he's advocating a sort of Buddhist non-resistance to fascism, including to Hitler. So he doesn't come out terribly well, but he was a great influence on Cage and uh, Rauschenberg and people like that, who were, or Ginsburg, you know, Allen Ginsburg, people who were influenced um, by Eastern philosophies in the 60s and onwards. Um, and it's true, his books look very readable, and, you know, his basic introductions to and accounts of Zen Buddhism um, are probably still quite a good read, but... Um, uh, where were we? Oh yeah, I was going to um, Shirakawa Go. Um, I think the, the, the Japanese uh, idea is just to continuously redevelop things and to have a basically a modern and functional cityscape. 
in which anything goes, really. Uh, and that's why the architecture is really flourishing here in terms of young architects who can do anything without necessarily much planning permission restriction. Um, and houses considered as consumer durables which will lose their value rather than being considered as assets which you have to keep for the next probably more conservative owner um, and think about their tastes. You don't have to do that. You'll assume that your, your beautiful modern cube house will be demolished and replaced by some even more modern cube house um, when it comes you know, 25 years down the line when it becomes outdated. I'm a bit of an aficionado of uh, mid-80s brutalist uh, concrete uh, building in Japan, some of which we could see in um, Kanazawa. Kanazawa um, it's got a lot of old wooden houses, quite pretty ones. Anyway, politics, because <laughs> my next task, now I'm back from that holiday, I've got, uh, what, three weeks left before I have to leave for Europe and do my, do my journeyman work as a musician, as Momus, and as David Bowie. A few David Bowie concerts, too, coming up in April, May, and June. Um, my task is to write an essay uh, for my longtime editor, Ingo Nierman, for the um, Sternberg, um, an anthology of um, writings on communism. So I have to start thinking about what does communism mean to me and it, to what extent would I call myself a communist? Well, I, I, I don't think you can really call yourself a communist because that's a, really that's the social system of a country that's, that seems to describe to me with a certain historical time frame. Definitely I'm a Marxist in, in the sense that a lot of my thinking has been formatted by Marxism. Um, but there's a lot of contradictory stuff in me politically, and I just wanted to maybe pick apart the strands of that, the strands of my own in, internal contradictions. A person is a series of tensions, dynamics, conflicts, contradictions. And politics itself is a messy process because you're always weighing up uh, one principle against another, or pragmatic things come in and change you or your situatedness changes what you are trying to do philosophically. There are a lot of dirty botched compromises which have to be made at every single point along the line. I was going to say Edinburgh being a conservative city, uh, we're, we're thrown back into an independence debate just now which is very volatile and very um, fiery and divisive, um, divisive in a good way because uh, uh, what we need right now is opposition to the current disastrous Brexit shipwreck. And um, one, the wonderful Nicola Sturgeon is the only politician who seems to have the guts to stand up to what is inherently and obviously a suicidal and ridiculous process. This um, impossible extrication of Britain from the European project. Anyway, um, one of my <laughs> things I'll be doing on the trip back to Europe is visiting family, and I'm just not going to even go there with the independence question, if I can possibly avoid it, because our family is hopelessly riven between... Oh, no, no. There's a minority of us who are anti-independence um, and a, major, a, a silent majority of us who don't dare tell those two <laughs> that, uh, that we are actually uh, yes voters. And um, so uh, it's, it's a very, very... And, and, and some of us are, are getting old... Uh, um, some in the generation above me are getting old and perhaps will not live to see the independence um, referendum when it does come around. So we really don't want to all be on bad terms and to be poisoned again by this. But I'm very much in favour of there being a, a second referendum and it being won by the yes side. So that's me laying my cards on the table. Why be a nationalist in the era when there seems to be far too much emphasis on borders? Well, because... Um, Scotland um, can be more left-wing as an independent country. It's as simple as that. It's a pragmatic thing. And uh, left-wing is good. I mean, all this... Um, okay, on, on a purely practical level, it means more social provision and it means more um, government oversight of private uh, greed or, or rather the private activities. Private... You know, as Keynes and other people knew, the private sector needs get a strong government regulation in order to, to survive, because if left to its own devices, it takes this very, very destructive roller coaster ride. It becomes a huge casino in which there are very few winners, actually. Um, but actually, but I really wanted to go back to the Marxism. Well, to, OK, let me first of all, let me say, just in terms of my own um, development, 
all the contradictory places that my politics comes from. Okay, I studied... Uh, no, let's go back even further to childhood. Where I'm, I'm basically a cosmopolitan. So one of my first and strongest uh, feelings is that I want to go somewhere else. Um, I want to wave the magic wand, which is the jet plane. The jet plane is our magic wand, which is the most sure and rapid and effective way to change the world around you. Simply get on this, this wand, this, this jet, and go somewhere else. And lo and behold, everything around you is different. And it might well be a lot more to your tastes. So you could say that's a slightly reactionary and escapist politics, but it is my politics. And, and uh, you know, I have come to, I'm an expat, I've come to live an immigrant, if you prefer, come to live in a different country where things are more um, pleasing to me, politically, um, um, but more, more importantly, culturally, because I think you can make political changes and not change the underlying culture very much. So, um, although I'm not, I'm not a fan of Abe, you know, the, the Prime Minister of Japan or the LDP, who have mostly been in power since the Second World War, nevertheless, there is something pleasing to me about the culture of Japan, which is the collectivism and the sense of uh, um, community harmony and self-abnegation. Uh, again, Japan... It, 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 it's a huge topic which we could spend several of these videos talking about, but there's the Bushido spirit of self-denial and stoicism and duty and honour and all the rest of it, but there's also a kind of uh, trashy pop culture and um, uh, a, a sexual energy which comes from the underlying pagan religion of Shinto, etc., etc. These are all elements in Japan, but I was talking about me, sorry. Talking about me, so cosmopolitanism, always pretending when I was coming back, sent back to boarding school from other countries, pretending to be from the other country and doing down Scotland. For instance, when I came back from Athens to Edinburgh to school, I used to say to my friends, well, now I think of Edinburgh as just this little cluster of shacks on the horizon because I've, I've been to the real Athens. Edinburgh gets described as the Athens of the North, but it's actually a cluster of these rather trashy ornaments like the Scott Monument or, you know, it's like someone's mantelpiece with all these weirdly shaped little trinkets which you may or may not like and may or may not think are a good way to decorate a city. Um, whereas I've been to the place with the Acropolis and, you know, <laughs> not much apart from the Acropolis apart from a lot of white rather faceless apartment buildings. But um, warm weather, very important warm weather. And to school with girls in it, you know, amazing. So they're also, I, I have this tendency to idealize the other and to try to, to reach the horizon where the other seems to reside, but never quite able to, because by the time you get to the horizon, the other is the here and now. It becomes the domestic humdrum surrounding reality. Even Japan, to some extent, has now become that. Okay, so there's this escapism, exoticism which you could say is a kind of politics, a politics of uh, a, a, a privileged politics in which you can simply choose where to live and choose the circumstances of your existence in a stateless way. And that's the idea of being a world citizen, very much under attack by the current political regime, which wants to build water, uh, walls and borders and really captivate, capture the uh, population within a national boundary, which is uh, increasingly irrelevant. So it's a backlash against, uh, I think, a long-term inevitable process of globalization, the shrinking of the world, the global village, as Marshall McLuhan used to call it. That is the long-term trend. A lot of short-term politics is really just a kind of pathetic reaction against things which are going to happen anyway. And I think globalization can't be stopped. And what we're seeing is little pathetic backlashes. Luckily, one just failed in Holland. The Populist Party lost um, our... our, our, our just temporary resistance to that. Um, what would be the next major strand of my politics? It would probably be um, aestheticism, um, becoming a literature student, you know, and, and um, inherent in being a literature student, studying the greatest that has been thought by the most well-formed minds. I mean, obviously there's a strong elitism in that, you're looking at why is X original and why not original, or why has X survived the test of time, is, you know, sometimes you would say timeless, although the kind of um, academic discipline I have been through is, is not uh, saying things are timeless, but that 
we should study their times and how they relate to their times and what Eno calls the senius. Even Shakespeare comes out of a scene. What is the genius of that scene? It's the senius, that idea. Um, a historiographical approach. Um, so, but it's a, again, it's about exceptionalism. It's about, rather than the exoticism of distance, it's the exoticism of rare talent. And, um, you know, there's an element of Miss Jean Brodie about that. You know, that Mussolini is a great man, and um, my girls are the creme de la creme. It's the, the idea of studying the creme de la creme and becoming yourself, refining yourself. And um, obviously it's a meritocratic idea. It's an um, equality of opportunity, yes, but not equality of result. It's not communism, is it? I mean, we don't... It, English studies have become a little bit more levelling in the sense that, oh, we should emphasize more women or we should emphasize more black writers or you know try to level it up in terms of the demographics of the the countries these literatures come out of but that again is a backlash um, against the general tendency which is to elevate people of great talent you know the Leonardo da Vinci not a writer but there are some people who are simply very very creative and are beyond the common herd, and, we sh and there's something aspirational about we should study their minds because they have great minds and interesting thoughts. Um, and I still very much subscribe to that, this sort of almost religion of creativity and of um, finding that genius within yourself. We all have some, some fire, some of that um, Promethean fire in us, and th there's nothing wrong with uh, saying we should move towards our own inner Prometheus and our inner genius. But obviously it's not... Um, I think it applies in the cultural zone. You can't really apply it in the political zone. You shouldn't, you shouldn't start saying, well, only geniuses should vote. You, know, this kind of, you can't extrapolate it outside of the cultural, as in so often, as is so often the case, um, people, what happens in the culture zone is sometimes and, and quite often the flip, the reverse of what happens in the uh, other zones. OK, talking about reverse and flips and polarities and things, um, I spoke the other day about um, gay culture, being queer, being influenced by perversity and queerness. Oscar Wilde, Joe Orton, the basic uh, um, scenario, which has played out so often in gay theatre, or theatre written by gay writers, that um, normality is a kind of um, aberration and that perversity is the true honesty and authenticity and integrity. And uh, that's uh, a, a, an amusing, it's usually played out as a comedy, you know, that uh, the, the, um, the strange fascination of, uh, of um, truly wicked people, all this kind of thing, which is true in, in the, the same way that in journalism, you know, dog bites man is boring and man bites dog is interesting. Uh, what, what works in culture, what works in especially that kind of comedy satire, inversion, literally an invert. An invert is a, a, one word for a gay person. And, if, and inverts, as playwrights, often invert the common sense of the logical daily world and for comic effect. So I've been very influenced by that and also the theoretical expansion of that into um, serious uh, philosophy by people like Georges Bataille, the idea of um, a, a perverse world. And it, it, it goes in with a, a green and ecological philosophy when you say that actually to be a breeder, you know, is the most sinful thing you could do in a world which is overpopulated and polluted. Uh, we don't need um, to breed. Um, so it's an anti-natalist kind of line as well. That this gay, perverse, um, uh, light touch, post-materialist, all this kind of eco-philosophy can, can actually work with a pervert philosophy as well. That's one strand. <laughs> it's all getting very complex. It gets even more so when we talk about existentialism. I was a teenage existentialist, and uh, so I read a lot of... Um, well, I read Nietzsche for a start, which is... You know, existentialism is generally... Although it was, uh, people like Sartre, Sartre claimed existentialism as a humanism, um, existentialism has a lot of connections with the right-wing thinking as well, because if you look at Nietzsche... Um, God is dead and all that stuff. So it comes on. To, it's beholden to us to come up with a, to revalue, revaluate all values, a revaluation of all values, um, to come up with a human 
oriented uh, philosophy which doesn't which is not Christian uh, Nietzsche's attacks are on mainly on Christianity the Christian idea of being meek, being the opposite of all striving and all contention as Nietzsche puts it um, the Christian idea of um, not thinking for yourself putting your trust in an imaginary supernatural being who's going to guide you and who loves you you know in this rather yucky sticky way um, and yet who never seems to manifest him or herself in in the world. Um, so uh, you, you have this strong sense of personal responsibility that I am alive only once, I am in control of my own destiny, it is my responsibility to make the best of that I can according to my own lights. That's really the existentialist message I, I took. It's also, yeah, it's very much about thinking about death, thinking about the absence of anyone else who can make choices for me, um, thinking about the individual. Uh, and there were uh, heroic attempts. I mean, it's funny that you, a lot of these intellectual conflicts within oneself are very well dramatized by conflicts between writers. So Sartre and Camus, they're falling out over commitment, the idea of being a member of the Communist Party. Sartre are very much in favor of political commitment, um, and Camus not. Uh, uh, these, this, or, or between Marx and Freud, you know, these are the, the huge um, uh, shadows cast by people like that. I am both a Marxist and a Freudian, and of course Jacques Lacan is the place where they start to fuse, or Deleuze, Guattari, uh, a lot of these, a lot of this comes through France. At the same time you have situationism, you have, or surrealism, André Breton was still, André Breton who's a communist and a surrealist, and that's a bit of a difficult conflict to resolve in itself. So okay, we have existentialism plus exceptionalism of genius and English literature and all that, plus exoticism and cosmopolitanism, plus Marxist ideas. So by the time I get to university, very much um, studying Marxist thinking, my best friend is a Marxist and we have long burning the midnight oil debating the questions of Marxism. And so if I have to write this es essay about Marxism or communism for um, Ingo, what I'm going to talk about is the concepts that have stayed with me, and they're important concepts and have not lost not one single jot nor whit of their importance in modern times. They're um, concepts like uh, alienation. The worker is alienated from his own processes of labor by the division of labor. Um, he doesn't own the means of, of um, production and he doesn't uh, gain or win the fruits of his labor. This is the famous clause four that the Labour Party eradicated. They crossed out deliberately because that was the socialist part of their um, party um, manifesto. Basically, the, the whole raison d'etre of the, of the Labour Party up until the 1990s was to, to win the fruits of his labor for the worker. Uh, which seems perfectly reasonable, you know, to, to get the worker who is um, simply paid a, a basic living wage, usually, um, to, to give him profit share, you know, essentially. That was um, crossed out because it was seen as too socialist for the British Labour Party. A very sad moment. Um, and, um, but also this... Um, Okay, re reification, uh, what a fantastic concept. Marx was, was analyzing 19th century um, manufacturing capitalism. He came from Germany to Britain, went and studied very closely factories in Manchester with Friedrich Engels. So what they were doing when they came up with Das Kapital and uh, the, the Communist Manifesto in particular, was looking at a particular um, uh, stage of capitalism but they anticipated very well, I think, the future stages of capitalism. In other words, the dematerialization um, and, uh, of labor. And I think reification is a particularly important concept. The reif reification uh, literally means thingification. In other words, the relationships between people in society get seen increasingly in the false consciousness of capitalism as relationships between things. So... Um, there's, there's this attempt almost to, to, to cloud over and kick, kick the dust over, kick sand across, kick sand in our eyes, to not see relationships between capital and labor, bosses and workers, um, or consumers and workers as human relationships, but to see them essentially as things. So you look at your iPhone, it's a thing. 
in your hand. You don't think about the fact that this is actually a series of relationships between people um, commanding manufacture, um, carrying out manufacture, importing, exporting, designing, um, and also, of course, dictating how you should use it. Uh, the whole mode d'emploi, uh, the um, user's manual side of the iPhone, or the fact that everyone's now addicted to it, that's a whole other series of social relations, or the um, relationship between you and the app makers, or you and the advertisers who inc increasingly are dominating social media. Social media is basically um, the site of advertising now. So all these things are social relationships that you want to be or maybe don't want to be, perhaps it has nothing to do with what you want, but you've been hooked into an addiction which then puts you directly in line of an advertising stream, which also makes you uh, essentially, perhaps unwillingly again, um, responsible for what happens in the Foxconn factories in China and the, the uh, worker conditions where people workers are living in dormitories and uh, committing suicide and all the rest of it. That is all a very much a modern, ongoing example of what Marx was talking about in terms of reification, that um, we have to think about human relationships in all these things which seem to be objects. Also, I would say the idea of the class in itself and the class for itself is tremendously important uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to think about society. We, this is the tragedy of our times, is that what the people who should be Marxists, who should be um, communists essentially, who should be voting in their own objective interests, financial, economic, basic interests, material interests. Marxism is a materialism, after all. Um, dialectical materialism, as, as Marx said. So he was taking Hegel, Hegel's materialism, um, historical materialism, and turning it into a dialectical materialism. Dialectics simply means the conflict of classes, and the Hegelian dialectic is thesis, antithesis, synthesis. So, in other words, it's about negotiation. Something, again, we desperately need to learn from in our current times. We need to learn how, to, how capital and lab labor negotiate. We've almost eradicated unions in the last 30, 40 years, in, in America and Britain anyway. You need to have unions, you need to have negotiation, and you get a synthesis, which is a simply um, you know, a compromise, a botched political compromise between the two. And in the Hegelian dialectic, that is a kind of upward spiral by which productive conflict and negotiation continuously improves, um, in theory, improves things for everybody. So the class in itself is a group with a, a series of objective interests, like, for instance, the redneck middle American working class, who are doing particularly badly just now, um, and who are taking that out in a psychologically misguided way by um, on foreigners and, and sort of imagined immigrant class of Sudanese terrorists who don't even exist, um, who are suffering terrible things at the moment back in Sudan, and who are, um, yeah, being restricted or being blamed, or Mexicans who are being blamed. The people who uh, carry out a lot of the basic um, labor in the U.S., especially southern and western U.S., um, are being blamed for taking jobs away, you know, and it's not at all, this class in itself has not become a class for itself. In other words, it has not gained class consciousness in the purely Marxist sense uh, of realizing that its interests lie in unionization, collectivization, and socialism for America. Uh, you can't say that, though, because there's been such an imposition of false consciousness through the media. Um, it's, it's simply unthinkable. It's a kind of thought crime in the US now to, to start thinking in term, these socialistic terms, which at certain times, you know, the New Deal, for instance, uh, post-war, pre-war and post-war dam building projects and all, all the rest of it, the government has been very active and has been um, uh, useful in balancing the US and, and making more equality. The Gini coefficient is always the way you look at uh, equality. Um, what is the um, percentage, the, the, the poorest and the richest 10% of the population, you can make that into a coefficient um, between zero and one, and you can find out uh, how unequal a society is. The, the higher the number, the closer to one, the more unequal it is. Um, 
actually, the, the global Gini uh, coefficient has bec been becoming more equal because of the rise of China and India, and the, the previously very poor parts of the world actually have been getting richer. So there is a, this weird situation where, again, the ongoing general big trend is towards equality, actually. And these local... Um, I mean, the big the populist sort of uh, false consciousness, class not for itself... Um, uh, reactions of uh, populist parties are actually just a very small local thing. I'm not saying I, don't, I think one thing Marx was wrong about was that there was a scientific and historical inevitability to socialism, um, communism worldwide. I, I think you can't, I, but I do think the trend is towards that as people um, are better educated and you know basically don't don't die at the age of 40 of malnutrition, or whatever. There has to be a trend towards some kind of equality, and, and, and false consciousness can only really linger like a fog. For, for, <laughs> I'm tempted to say for as long as Rupert Murdoch is alive, false consciousness will be alive and well, but um, he will be replaced by other barons of false consciousness. I think I've probably said enough um, uh, to start thinking, anyway, in my own terms, about why I'm such a complex mess of... Uh, political impulses, some of them elitist, some of them um, pop, uh, um, communistic, uh, but also why the world is so. Uh, and, and this is all part of the great political cut and thrust. This is dialectics in itself, what I'm doing right now, although it's a monologue, it's dialectical in the sense that I'm saying, well, this doesn't work with this, and, and that's an interesting place to go to, that, that uh, conflict between those two ideas. Open University. Thank you.